um, you know, definitely moving in, in a direction to work together. So it's, uh, yeah, so thank you for that. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and to listen to all you guys, Mana'o, and all your thoughts in. Um, I definitely appreciate it. The This is going to be a fun dance. Um, this is the first PowerPoint I've ever uh, worked with in my life. Um, and my fiance, we were up till 2 o'clock last night working over the internet to try and put this together. So she's like, you ain't that good looking. You got to have something for people to look at. Um, so I, I'm figuring all this technology stuff out. Um, but yeah, so Ahupua, uh, Iuka, Ikai. That's just Ahupua um, is the system we're going to talk about today. It's our traditional land division system. Um, and Uka. If you're from Hawaii, you go to Hawaii, people say Mauka a lot. They say Mauka to Makai. It's a saying of like, oh yeah, uplands to the to the ocean. Um, as it goes, Mauka and Makai, the same same, are very similar to Iuka, um, Ikai. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. History um, of an activism for traditional Hawaiian farming. So where I'm based is, uh, is I like moving. I get real excited. So I'm excited about this type of stuff. Um, see. So obviously, I'm just going to move through this real fast so we can talk about activism. History of Hawaii, you guys know history of Hawaii. People went there, right? Uh, it's fun. We don't know exactly, but we do know exactly, right? I have this really good friend who's a cultural practitioner. The guy's unbelievable. He's one of those Hawaiians, uh, like my little cousin who was here earlier, heard that you can take him and you can put him on Hawaii at any time people were there and he fits in. He's this huge purple big man you know he looks I don't look the part he looks the part I got this good friend Kaina and uh, Kaina he looks the part you could do the same thing with him and he always talks about yeah I think we've always been on these islands I said wow that's a new interpretation even my grandma we trace our lineage to the second boat from Tahiti so it's cool that there are people with this it's disputed and I love that and we leave it at that point being people came to Hawaii um, we were there we became the Hawaiians people interbred became Hawaiians that's what we got but with them, this is where it becomes interesting, what's well, always interesting, but this is where I'm going to talk about. They brought plants. And, and that's an aha moment for me is when I started to realize what it took, A, to be able to taste the water and know where you're at in the Pacific Ocean. Um, and that's the story there is that these people on the ocean, they took these plants with them and they knew how to keep them alive for a really long period of time while they went across and they went to these different islands to um, inhabit them and and bring new plants with them. So that blew my mind, uh, always learning that. But it's the relationship with the plants um, that kind of sets us into where we're going right now. And so some of the canoe plants, I think, ooh, yeah, are, um, they have different numbers, 28, 32, something like that. But um, my a uh is banana, um, ulu, uh, new hao, noni, ko, uala. These are all plants that they brought. Sugarcane, uh, they have different names, of course. Uh, breadfruit, um, sweet potato. These are things that they were really good at bringing, and without them, they knew that wherever they went, they wouldn't have life. So they had to take care of them. They had to malama that, right? And so they took that on as a great responsibility. Um, and they brought them with, as, with chickens and other things as well. But for me to fathom being in the largest body, because Hawaii is the most isolated islands in the world, yes? We're 2,500 miles away from any uh, or the next continent, yeah? So it's very strange to me when, and for a lot of us, when we get referred to as uh, North American. This only happens when I check the surf report because on Surfline I have to go into North America to find Hawaii. And we're not in the Pacific region. It blows my mind, right? We're actually way closer to Marquesas, um, Tahiti, these other islands. Um, than we are to any other continent. So being out there, you have to be able to be sustainable. And I will argue later, uh, and I do all the time, that we are the best example for the world to show the world what sustainability is. Because we're the only closed circuit. Um, even other, con I mean, if you live way up in the north, my cousin's up in Alaska, that's hard. That's, a, that's like almost a closed circuit. But they're connected. They can walk somewhere. <laughs> if it push came to shove, she almost walked all the way to Russia. Um, that's, that's an unbelievable story. I'm still like, I'm still reeling from that story. That's, that's nuts. Um, but there's one plant that I want to talk about, and it's kalo. So they brought kalo, and kalo is so, so important to Hawaiians. Politically, it's extremely important to us now, um, but in our story, who it is to us, um, the presence that it has in our life, uh, sets us into what we're going to talk about with kuleana. So... Um, 
This is just a diagram of Kalo, and every part, the Oha, the Hulu, the, um, every part has a different meaning, yeah? But it's all related to family, which is really neat. When this thing sprouts off the side, they're called the keiki, they're the children. Right, so every part is part of our family, and our life is forever linked to Kalo. So the story of Haloa Kalo goes as such. Um, father uh, Wakea, the mother, um, Ho'oko um, Kukalani, that's the mother, that's the star, right? That's the star mother. And these two come together for a union and they have Haloa Kalo as the first child. And Haloa Kalo is stillborn. And so they take the, and every time they always go and they put him on the left. Sometimes they say they bury the body uh, and inside the house, sometimes they say outside the house, but it's always on the left, which is unique for those of you who are into tattooing. The Hawaiians wear their lineage on the left side of the body, right? It's a lineal line that runs up. So any tattoos on the left is to be your lineage. Um, so they have a stillborn. Out of him, out of that body that where they, where they plant it, grows kalo, grows the plant, the actual plant. The next child of these two's union um, is the kanaka, uh, the people. And so there's a relationship there. Haloa Kalo is the older brother, the older sibling to all Kanaka, to the people, right? And so in our family union, we have that, that the older siblings feed the younger siblings. But the younger siblings' job is to always ho'oponopono, to make everything right, to take care of the older siblings so that they don't have that hard time, right? So you work together to feed each other, to work together. Um, and that's our system that we get from this plant. And this is very real. This is, we've, in 2006, we won a really big battle against the University of Hawaii for patenting the genetic modification of Kalo. We said, how are you going to genetically patent and own the rights to our, our, our ancestor? You cannot do that. That's illegal. That's called slavery. Um, and you cannot own living, you cannot own people's um, ancestors. And we won that case. And I'm really happy to say that my family was a part of that, and it's really cool. Um, and it's a great victory for people everywhere, not just Hawaiians. Uh, a lot of the stuff we have going on is, you know, and that we learn from, obviously coming over here to Berkeley, I was outside just going, wow, people's park is right there. That's unreal. I was getting kind of nerdy about it. But we, we grab inspiration from everybody's stories and everybody's struggles, yeah? Um, so from Haloa Kalo, we get um, this system, we get this thing called kuleana. And your kuleana is your inescapable obligation to take care of it. So if you're from Hawaii, or you go to Hawaii to live, you have a kuleana, you take that on. And that is something that, that's a hill to die on for me. I, I, really, I really believe that. I don't care if you, whatever, you're from Mars, they always say, yeah. You have the obligation to take care of that land. And that spreads in our ahopua'a system from Mauka from the top of the mountains all the way into the ocean, into the reef system. Okay, and that's no choice. And we live in a modern world where we like to believe we have all these choices. Hawaiian society, a lot of our language, a lot of our things are set up no choice. Because it's not your choice to say, no, I don't want to take care of, of, of the land. I don't want to take care of the fish. I don't want to do these things. You don't have that choice. Because those things are there for you and they're going to help you. Right? If it wasn't for all those things, you wouldn't be here today. So you don't have the opportunity to say, no, thank you. I don't want to do this. Um, and so we get the, um, the, what you call, we get the, uh, the Ahupua'a system from our kuleana. And the Ahupua'a system, this is the island of Kauai. And so these are different um, moku. An island, mokupuni, the different moku are these different colors. These are different divisions. And each, in, in, in each moku, there's Ahupua'a. I live in um, Wayava is the Ahupua'a in which I live. But it goes from the top of the mountain out into the ocean. It's kind of like a piece of pie, right? And I'll s go over this real quick because we got things to talk about. But there's different parts. There's three different parts. You have Uka, which is the top part. And that's where um, your, your priests who would go to get feathers, right, for these big capes and these helmets. Maybe you guys have seen the Hawaiian royalty used to wear, right? And they wouldn't kill the birds. This is an amazing thing. They would sit there and they lure them in. Where they would make gum, and they lure them in, and then they trap them and they pull two feathers, maybe three feathers from each bird, and they let them go, because they knew that they needed to keep that population going, right? So it was very sustainable in that way in which there was reciprocal. They borrowed from them. They said thank you. You know, there was a ceremony they went with. Only certain people could do that. We built heiaus up in this area, heiaus for the elepaio. 
um, is a bird that would we would follow <coughs> to go up and find the best trees to make va'a, to make the canoes. Right, so this is the uplands. Not a lot of farming up there. Um, and that's, uh, what you call, <laughs> that's all the way up. That's up at the top. And then we have Kula, which is where most people live, right? Kula is like our fields. And Hawaiians are great farmers. Um, that's been our thing. We've been great farmers. In the middle of the ocean, a lot of people think, oh, Hawaiians, you guys eat a lot of fish. Some people ate fish. Most people ate wala, ulu, and kalo. Right? Poi is the most complex carbohydrate known to man, and it's the only human-produced food substance that no human is allergic to. So poi has the byproduct of kalo, has saved children's lives all around the world, and they come out and they can't have milk, or they can't eat these things, they come and get poi, because no human has been found allergic to it thus far. And that's something that we didn't need to genetically modify, right? And that's how I'm going to get to that in our activism, because that's one of our big battles. So that region um, is extremely important, and that's kind of the flatlands. So it's not all the way down by the water, but it's kind of up in the valleys, and there's a ton of fresh water, and our word for fresh water is why, is vi, or why, W-A-I. And our word for wealth is vi vi, or why why, yeah? And so the people who had the most fresh water had the most wealth because you could grow the most food, yeah? And each ahupua'a, running from the top all the way down, I think I have a better picture, was split up into what you could do in these. So you can see core trees, kukui, all these in the villages were near the rivers, and then running out into kai, into the ocean. And that was still your kuleana to take care of. Oftentimes in this society, people think the ocean is an endless thing, right? If it's, um, you can fish it all you want and nothing will, you can throw your stuff in it and it will just go away, right? But our, our system still works, because we all know that's not the truth. Our system still works in having to take care of those things. Um, all, all the way out into the ocean. So we built great fish ponds, um, unbelievable architectural feats, bringing water in from other areas, building these great uh, irrigation ditches, right, to bring water over so we could farm more efficiently. And all of this is in this system that is for everybody. And so when Europeans came over, they were really quick to classify and say, oh, they have nobility. Um, they have a system because we had a hierarchy. But the hierarchy, the highest dot in there, the one who told everybody what they got, right, some of the ali'i, they, they would designate these konohiki, these people to oversee this process, this area, because everybody farmed, right, or you fished, you had a job, um, but everything was shared, and if the, your konohiki wasn't giving you enough water for your lo'i, which would be your garden, uh, wasn't taking care of your rights well enough, well, they would kill him. Or they would just move away and say, you know what, I don't want to work for you anymore. Because I don't really work for you, I work the land because the land demands that I work for it. That's more important than your stature as a konohiki. And so that's how it works. So if you were a bad konohiki and everybody left your ahupua'a, one, you weren't tending to the gods. And that's how they saw that. Because the gods had forms that came out in your garden. They had forms that came out in the different animals, different streams, different winds. And if it wasn't being cared for in the way in which you had to take care for it, the stewardship, well, then people, you couldn't have that. So they would get killed. And that was the old system. Um, and so we have this great division um, uh, that happens, the, the great Mahele of 1848. And Mahele just means a division, a break. Where now we go into the more modern times of, um, sorry, I'll go back. This is just a fish pond. This is a beautiful fish pond. This is the very first one in Hawaii um, of its type. It's actually on Kauai. And... This is what it looks like today. Um, it's totally overgrown. Where we have a project going on, I'll go back to that later. Um, but this is, you can see, I'm not very good at playing with my images here. Um, but I, I put that in there because this is the Ahupua'a system. And back in the times, we had, the, to we had uh, the energy allocated for every person to go and be stewards of the land. Again, you didn't have that. And I'll reiterate that with Kuleana, you don't have the, uh, you don't have the choice. It's your obligation. And it's one that you should wear proudly. You know, we talk about that in that way, that you wear the, your obligation um, as a badge because it's a great thing to do this. And so one thing my auntie always says is she doesn't understand. She always goes, well, I don't know why everybody moves here. And then they try and turn it into the exact same place they just came from. They come over here and then they build these structures and they do all these things and they flatten this ground and they do all this. Why did they move here in the first place? 
why they never just stay in the city that they came from because they're happy there you know like why why come over here and change it to where you're from um and that's what happened so we do have um the plantation days and this is a big part and this is the segue into the activism because plantation days we all know 1778 captain cook comes over I got a big beef with Captain Cook. In our history, a lot of times we like to pin stuff on people, say it's his fault. It's her fault. It ain't nobody's fault. This is what happened, okay? And it's our fault for letting it get to this point. And so that's why we need activists. With 1778, he comes over. He was, uh, he was mapping things. Unfortunately for him, he came twice instead of once. Uh, second time, things were still okay. He tried to leave. And it was his re-entry on his second and a half time that they said, hey, bro, you wore out your welcome. You ain't supposed to be here anymore. Um, and they killed him and ate him. And that's, you know, that's just a part of history. It's not his legacy. He did a lot of other things. He went all the way around the world two and a half times. That's pretty phenomenal in the 1700s. That's unreal. Um, but what he brought was a map. And he mapped us, put us on the, uh, and people could get there. So then Christians started coming. Um, and with the Christianity became this major difference. And um, I'm not trying to pu put anybody on the spot, but that's what it, that's what it is. Christians viewed the world in one way. Uh, Kanaka viewed the world in a different way. Um, our way was Ahupua'a system, where it was communal. We farmed top to bottom. Uh, Christians oftentimes farmed across, or didn't know how to farm. And that's how we have the Great Depression, right, in America, is we didn't know how to farm in America. Westerners weren't great farmers over here. And that's not a bad, th you know, that's not a knock on anyone. That's just what it was. Uh, killed all the topsoil, drought happens, boom. Right there. Your whole economic thing goes downhill. In Hawaii, they, <coughs> they have this great mahele, they, this land grab happens, and we start to farm in a different way. Um, we lose a lot of the language, a lot of the religion. Things are, you know, it's every story. I'm not going to deal with that and sit on it too long because we've heard this story. It happens. That's what colonization is. Um, but the farming is what really changed, and the water rights really changed. And so now we're in a place where we see a lot of things not l like this. This is um, mangrove. And people think, they come to Hawaii, they go, oh, it's so beautiful, so green, eh? And most people, when they think of Hawaii, they think of really green. But like I said before, we're the most altered place in the world from our endemic state. That's amazing. Some of that the Hawaiians got to eat, absolutely. Uh, we brought 32 plants with us. Um, the rest of it was a giant, what, what's going to happen if we do this? Well, we have cows, so we need to feed our cows. So let's bring over this stuff we call buffalo grass. Well, we didn't realize cows don't eat grass that grows over their head and has thorns. So now it's just everywhere. That's what you're, you're looking at mangrove, which takes an inch every year out of our brackish water. It loves it. Florida loves their stuff because it brings uh, wildlife uh, refuge to birds. In Hawaii, it's eating up our navigable rivers. It's eating our vai vai. It's eating our ability to make lo'i, right? It's eating up this fish pond that has a beautiful story. And some other time I'll tell it to you because it's kind of a long one, but it's a wonderful story how it gets there. Um, but we start to farm sugarcane, which Hawaiians brought sugarcane, right? And this is how a lot of our ancestors, um, some of my family, got to Hawaii, right, is plantation workers. So we're starting to create in this 20th century, the 19th and 20th century, um, these big plantations. And the land is now, there's no ahupua'a anymore. It's private ownership. Kauai is basically owned by five families. Um, the ownable land is five major corporate families that own it. Um, these ones are all, this is Kekaha. I live uh, about six blocks from this tower. It's still there. And just as kind of a side note, and Fenosha can laugh because I go on tangents. Um, that building is still standing. It's been decommissioned. They stopped. They literally closed their doors. Um, they didn't tell anybody. It's 1996. They don't tell anybody they're going to they're stop operations. They just did. And the whole community just shut down. They didn't know what to do because they just locked everyone out of work. But they left this building there, and now it's condemned with asbestos. But they don't know who's going to take it down because it's blowing that wind, because we have winds every day of the year, into an elementary school right there. But they don't want to take it down because this is a symbol we're holding on to as the great period of industrialization in Hawaii. This made us what we were. Um, and so we have this history, and now there is only one working sugarcane plantation at the height. There was 82. Now there's one. This one is uh, in Maui, and it doesn't actually make sugarcane. The reason they don't grow sugarcane commercially anymore is because it's bad for the environment. 18-month gestation period. That's a long time for a plant to grow. To get one cube of sugar, it's about two adult stalks, right? So next time you take two drops, 
Makes you, ooh, that took a long time. That's a lot of product, right? So they didn't do that because they couldn't make a lot of money off it. Um, yeah, in Koloa, 1835 to 1996, Kekaha, uh, 18, er, 1878 to 2000. Um, and again, that's the one I said they just closed, th they just closed down. So left our community kind of just sitting there. And now this brings us into where we're at today. And uh, Ekolomai, I'm sorry if I'm rushing this, um, but I wanted to get to this point where we can kind of have a conversation about what activism is and why it's necessary in indigenous communities and why it has to be led but us, the people of your land, and all the people, period. Everybody has a job. Everybody, no matter where you're from, you got a job, you got a place. But it has to be led by the people. The people of the land, right? They gotta be, you gotta be led there. Um, and this is what we have. So this is the fight that I can talk about a little more because this is where I'm, I live in between Pioneer and Syngenta. And, uh, they, we are in our little community in Kekaha, Kauai, we have more restricted use pesticides in 18 tons that we know of sprayed annually than anywhere else in the world. We're a petri dish. The United States said, that's our territory. Yeah, in the early 90s, go ahead. You can genetically modify everything over there and test it because we have three growing seasons, right? So we're a petri dish in the middle in a closed circuit. So if stuff really goes bad, well, they're far enough away that it's not going to go anywhere else. And they're testing on indigenous people, as they have for a very long time. We know this story. I'm not going to talk about the Diné, and we're not going to talk about these things and these horrible mining experiments, right? Um, but it's still going on, and a lot of people don't know about it. And it's happening in my backyard. And so this last year, we passed a bill, uh, 2491. I don't know if you guys heard about it over here. It was setting precedent for the whole world. And everybody was kind of watching, who, know, who was into this type of activism. They were watching to see what happened in our county. And we passed it. We passed a bill that said, hey, you guys are neighbors. You got to tell us what you're doing. That's it. We want to know what you're spraying and when you're spraying it. We just have some questions. We have 10 times the cancer rate. We have 10 times more birth defects in our children than anywhere else in this country. And we want to know why. We think it's you. Will you tell us what you're using? And right now, we're going through being sued, which is awesome. Because as an activist, you got to love that. And they, they threatened, they threatened, they threatened. They said, yeah, we're going to sue you guys. And I went up and I said, how dare you threaten to sue us? You've been here for 15 years. You've been here for 1,000 years, 1,500 years. Whatever you tell us, that's the number you gave us because we don't go by years. We've been here for a long time. And you can come over here and because we asked you to stop spraying near our hospitals, our neighborhoods, and our schools, you're going to sue us? So I said, bring it on, right? You got to love that. You really got to love that. It's time for action, right? Because they've, they've bulldozed these companies, Bass, Dahl, Syngenta, Pioneer. Pioneer is the only seed company. The rest of them are classified as chemical companies, right? And they farm all this corn and they spray all this corn and none of it is for our consumption, right? And these guys have been bulldozing these small farmers and they've been bullying them. Monsanto as well. They're on Oahu. We don't have them on Kauai. We have them on Oahu and Molokai where I'm from. But they've never come up against the people who don't have anywhere to go. We are that land. That land is us. It is our inescapable obligation to take care of that land and the water because we have the fastest dying reef system in the world in Hawaii. So if I was a tourist, I wouldn't go there. You know, especially after knowing all these things, I wouldn't go there until we get it taken care of so we could ho'oponopono, we can set stuff straight again, we can start to clean it up, we can start to do the things that need to be done. And who knows how to do that? Well, people who live there. I'm not just saying Kanaka, I'm not just saying Hawaiians. People who live there, this is very much a collaboration between a lot of people. Yeah? And so, um, I think I have this real fast. I wanted to show you guys a real quick video of something that we did, and then I'm going to continue to just try to talk about activism and, and where we're going.
There you go. The message is still good. It's just brought it in singing. And I can talk over this too. So this is literally where we go to have like, you know, where you go party. And they have it dammed right there. Yeah? So that's where it stops. But this winter, all that's been gone, right? Because the, the ocean comes in, it pulls everything out. So right now, this beach, I shot this in um, November. Or, yeah, right before November. Right now, that beach doesn't exist. It's not even there. It all got pulled in. So all their industrial stuff, like this river right here, is, it's all the way into the ocean. So we have a red ring of, it looks like blood red water. From all their irrigation, all their overflow from the pesticides, it's all going straight into the ocean. This field right here was linked to, that's the elementary school. And two times, the middle school, two times in 2006 and in 2008, the school was evacuated because the staff and the students were throwing up because they were getting sick. And when they asked these guys, what you guys spraying? They said, oh, it wasn't us. It must have been some weeds or something, some stink weeds. And they were allowed to have that as, as, their, as their answer. And right here, you can see in this video, we're asking for 500 feet as a, as a border, right? We got 100. That's what they gave us, which I live 250 feet <laughs> from the ocean. So, <laughs> I mean, and I'm 100 feet the other way from where they spray. So do we hear them at 3 in the morning? Yes. That's when they're always spraying. Um, well, they got stuck. Oh, internet's slow. Um, but point being, there's some other really good visuals in here, and it shows the lo'i, and you guys can see some of that. Um, but the point is, is that we can talk about it, and talk about it, and talk about it. And when I was on the debate team at uh, Montana State University, I, I think I'm the only person in the regional, they told me I was the only person in debate history to quote a rapper for their final closing argument. And I said, if you want some, get some, bad enough, take some. Snoop D-O-double-G. And I said, and, that, and then like, the buzzer went off, meme, and your argument was done, and I said, I got it in, you know? But that's truly what I think about. Because we do all this politicking, and we try and pass these bills, and we need that. There's energy for that. People need to do this. You guys are awesome. All the young people in here going to school, beautiful. Keep on going. Because guys like me, who seldom put on pants, and seldom wear clothes, and like to be outside and fighting all this stuff, I'm the guy who's camping out overnight, right? We're the ones who are out there who make the process stop when all the politicking can't happen. We need you. We need to support each other because there's all these different energies, right? And so this academia, it's wonderful. I, I love being a part of it, and it's always fun. It's like a glimpse into a world that I go, oh, boy, that's way over my head. Um, we need you guys' help, and you guys need our help because you guys ho'oponopono us. If it wasn't for the ones like me running around that, trying to figure out how to stop the process, most literally, you know, if this thing, if we do get sued and they go, and I told them this in the thing, I said, hey, you're not, you may win in the court, but I hope you're ready to, to get that you cannot win here, right? Push come to shove. We can shove because our backbone is here. You, you flew here. You know, we can push you off this island. And I like the opportunity to do that. And so I try, when we talk about activism, we talk about the need for educated activism. Um, it's now. It, it is a need. We need young people to go get educated. We need young indigenous leaders to sprout up from wherever you're from and to help each other and to talk to each other. So when I saw this opportunity to come to Berkeley, of all places, where, uh, you know, right next door to Laney College, where Huey uh, went and studied law classes, right? And he was educated, and he knew, well, I can't observe what you're doing, uh, because that's 20 feet, and that's, that's the state law says that I'm able to observe police doing whatever they're doing. You know, he knew those laws so he could be effective. Just as so much of the other great activism in this Bay Area they knew these things, they were educated so they could be effective. And that's the same message that we're trying to have and we're trying to do is, right now these companies, uh, they want our schools to stay small. They want our education system to stay bad because they don't need educated Hawaiians. They need field workers. You know, and I don't hold, you know, my grandpa was a field worker. He died of cancer because back then they used to sp just spray on him. You know, so you were working for Dole back in the day, they would just spray you. Uh, and that's how that worked. And then when you got cancer and you died and your jaw deteriorated, there was nothing. Now, we know, you know, it's like back in the 50s, smoking was good for you. 
you know, and then well, someday we're going to look back and say, back in the 2000s, milk was great for your bones. You know, and we're at that point right now where we're getting a lot of good research going, hey, like even that one, milk is horrible for your body. Don't drink the stuff. You got no deal eating cheese. That stuff makes your bones deteriorate faster than anything else. And for the last hundred years, they've been telling us, no, drink it, drink it, drink it. Right? Just like these subsidies, just like this stuff. So it's about education because without this, you know, a lot of our community, we don't know. And it doesn't mean they're not educated. It means that they've been working the three jobs that it takes to stay on your land because it's extremely expensive. Um, and, and they don't have the opportunity to go to those meetings. So a lot of times we feel not represented because it's the wealthy who came from, now I'm in California, but we do have a lot of Californians. They come over and they have a lot of money when they do and they buy land. And they're at least, but they're, you know, they want to know because they're retired. So they're like, hey, this is happening outside my house. What the heck? You know, and so they show up. And so right now we're working with them and they're, you know, giving us funding so that we can show up too, take the day off. Because I tell you right now, when this whole fight went down that I don't think we'll be able to go through it, but um, Pioneer was, they were busing in their employees. And there were guys that I work with, that, you know, that pay me, that my, uh, my business, which I'll finish up talking about as a way of activism, they, they were sitting there having their free lunch and their free breakfast because that was their work day is go there and bully and intimidate in numbers. And so we had this big divide of um, agriculture. You know, you're either pro-ag or you're against ag. And we're going, no, wait, as Hawaiians, we are agriculture, right? It's our right to reinstill this ahupua'a system. And that's what we're fighting for today, right? And so one thing that we're doing, and I can only talk about my family and what I represent and some of the people that I work with, is we are reinstilling the ahupua system without asking permission. So they don't want to give it to us, but we're not asking for their permission. We're just doing what it is. So right now we have one puho nua, which is a safe house. Um, there's a heiau at the top where it was built for Chief Ola, who was the king that brought agriculture to the west side. He was known as the one who helped everybody get water. Um, his Hey, I was above our house in Wayava, and it's a protected site. So it's also called Poison Valley. Most people know it. They don't know Wayava, the name. They know Poison Valley because that's where all of the poison was held for the sugar cane. And it's still there. It's, you can't go to certain places. It's fenced off because it's so poisonous and so dangerous. It's leaked in and all this. Um, but we're rebuilding it. So we've already built... Um, I don't know how to get back to that. We've already built... And that's not it. So, Am I touching everything? I just, there's a picture of our lo'i. Does anybody know how to do this? Get the, get the PowerPoint back. <laughs> what we've done is we just started rebuilding the lo'is, right? And because of Kalo, because they recognize Kalo as our ancestor, if we farm Kalo, they can't take it away. And they have to give us water. So we've retained that right. And so what we've done and what I do for a living is I have a, a small academy training, uh, trying to connect athletes, um, our youth through athleticism and through sports and through all these things culturally back to the land. So they're getting to work out and they're getting to do all this stuff, but they're doing it in a cultural way. And one of our workouts is we come on Saturday and this is our little spot in Wyava that's totally overgrown. And you can see this is just one day. That was all the grass. We by hand, we pulled it. Um, and now this lo'i is actually dug out. We went back with shovels and we dug it out with 20 young boys and girls. And um, we have three of those that we've slated to build all the way up. And after that's done, we're going to keep on going. And we're going to try and bring that valley back to life by taking these things out and just doing it. And uh, it doesn't always work that way. And there's going to be a lot of struggles. But the point being is sometimes you just got to stop asking for permission. Because never in our history have they said yes. You know, so at some point, the powers that be, you just got to be your own power that be, yeah? And you just got to go for it. And we're one, just one little community. Um, it's a great opportunity just to talk with you guys about, um, about what we do. Here's my, my favorite. He's not my favorite. He'll probably watch this YouTube video and be like, oh, I'm your favorite. But uh, this is Maka. He's eight. And it's cool to be able to take these young homana, these young students, and they have to speak Hawaiian when we start every class. Right? So we have list of rules and they have to avala all and they're getting better and they're starting to understand them. They're saying, oh, I know what that word is, you know? And I see them in the community. And we're starting to reconnect them 
to that so that yes we want to empower them to go and go to college and go do all these things and learn and be who you want to be but know your kuleana and know that you have to come home and when you do come home there's going to be a lo'i that needs two hands and two knees and two legs to get in there and to work that sucker because it's our right and it's our obligation to do so and uh when that title came up about native landscapes and um and connecting to the environment it was you know it, it sometimes it feels like we're talking in circles but and like we shouldn't have to talk about this you know it's one of those like you know we shouldn't have to talk about doing this um but we do and now is the time to take a lot of action and that wonderful um woman who spoke before me what an unbelievable project and i think she had a really strong point there with taking action today um and and you can't wait and so this is just what we're doing we have an academy we're doing the kind thing i have i am contractually obligated as the owner of my business to talk about that we're trying to raise money right now and so there's a link kind snacks they donate ten thousand dollars to things in the community and you don't even have to vote for us go vote and look at how amazing things are going on in people's communities and these are all little startups this is just ours um our academy trying to bring in you know a with colonization happened a diabetes etc cetera, etc cetera. um and our garden project and the things we're doing that way is our way of saying hey how are we going to make sure that the next generation doesn't come up with diabetes the next generation doesn't come up with these horrible eating habits and it's reconnecting them so that's the do the kind thing that's on kindsnacks.com and then this is just our website because i like when people check out what we're doing we're keeping up on we're going to post pictures of the kids in the lo'i and if you guys ever make it to Kauai, you're more than welcome. Come check us out and put you to work. Um, you're more than welcome to come join us out there and, and see what we got going on. But um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. I hope it wasn't too scattered. large tourist destination um, so I n I'm just amazed at everything that you said I never knew about this but like so how do the tourists miss seeing what you're seeing every day well it's shiny you know it's the green you keep it green people don't know I mean green was a big thing keep it green eh? like the green movement so it's still green it's just a really bad green you know it's a really poison green and there's a lot of money in the state you know we're working against our state we're working against our local government and we're working against these large corporations because they're all in bed together um eating cookies that's what people do in bed you know and they're telling us no uh you know we we don't want the tourists to know this so they basically that's why they don't want the the exposure they don't want to have to disclose what they're doing because when people realize that atrazine is in our soil like we can't drink the water at my house my dogs don't we my dogs drink filtered water i think they're the only dogs i know that have to drink filtered water and other people do don't you know other people do that but it's a precaution we take because it's leaked so deep into our soil but they don't do that and then they don't tell them in proximity uh to where it's at so not knowing is pretty much how the state has taken uh advantage of keeping people coming over yeah. Um, did you have one more? <clears throat> um, just on the topic of tourism, aside from uh, the the chemical the chemical pollution that's going on, do you see any environmental impacts from the tourist traffic? Yeah, totally. Yeah, a hundred percent. Five years ago, I never would have thought that I would want to invite tourists up to work in the Lo'i. Um, I was really against tourism. I actually spoke in Merced when I went to school there for two years and I, try, I tried to convince everybody to not come to Hawaii. My whole platform was don't come until we're given power to make things better, right? Because that's how you vote with your dollar bills. Um, because yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, people spraying the sunscreen, something people don't even think about because that's a necessity, right? You get so sunburned, da da da. But just that, you put that on your skin, right? and you jump in the water and you do that times a million that creates the silt that goes over our reef and a reef is a breathing organism so you're suffocating it's like putting a paper bag or a plastic bag over someone's head 
Um, so absolutely. And the infrastructure, we don't have infrastructure for tourism like other islands do. And this boom, they built all these hotels, they wanted all these things. So economically, yeah, they needed it for the state because these big sugar plant plantations just dipped out. Um, but it's, we haven't been able, we can't sustain it. We absolutely can't. We have one ro road that goes three quarters of the way around the island, you know, so. Um, on a side note, if you're interested in that, look up Molokai and what our model has been over there because they keep the rooms, there's only like 250 rooms period to rent at any given time on the island. Um, and we lost a battle last year by military assistance. The United States brought in their Navy with their guns and they forced the guns in our face and said, you will let tourists come here because we had voted and said, nah, thank you for the opportunity, but we don't want cruise boats to come to our island. We don't even have a stoplight. What are we going to do with all these tourists? Um, and so we stopped the process. They allowed us to talk about it and then they forced the process after we said no. So that's... You know, a different model that we've had is we've been really successful about keeping those hotels out and keeping everything really, really small. But that'd be another model of um, what we're trying to get to on Kauai is how we've done on Molokai. Thank you. Barbara, you might have emphasized this, but I'm still not clear um, about the extent to which um, these pesticides are being sprayed in lower income communities from mm. an environmental justice perspective versus some of the wealthier, you know, they're, I, I would, actually, I don't know this, but I would imagine they're extraordinarily wealthy areas yeah. on this island where people have had to stop or, 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 or have. They didn't go there to begin out. with. Yeah, they didn't. Um, it's really interesting and I don't want to take up too much time, but it's um, the, the Kikaha has the most fluent Hawaiian speakers in the world per capita. We have the highest population of Hawaiian speaking people in the world because Ni'ihau is just across the way. It's a Hawaiian island. We'll not even go into that. But um, this is, we're surrounded. Every side of Kikaha, besides the ocean, is surrounded by these fields because it's owned by one family. So they deemed that, yeah, that's all egg. They're going to do that. The very wealthy, wealthy places aren't on the west. <clears throat> they're up north, you know. And for some reason, when people moved to Hawaii and they really fell in love with it, everybody wanted to go north because it's rainy and it's green and it's like, you know, that tropical heaven. Um, so they don't have the same, but they have a little bit, but it's a totally different thing. So they haven't had, they haven't felt that restriction. But luckily up north, the wealth has really started this movement because the poor side where I live is the workers. You know, my neighborhood, it's hard. It's very scary for people, families. Um, uh, my sister, who is a single mother, um, one of them, was... She's been like the face of this thing. She's been fighting this thing, but she's afraid in her own neighborhood because every single one of her neighbors works for them. All the students that I have that you saw in that picture, every single one of their parents works for the, the seed company. So, you know, in being an activist and trying to spur them to do the right, you know, to do the educated thing, I can't come out and be like, hey, don't do that. I have to be, you know, hey, you know, there's a reason we drink soy milk, guys, and it's GMO free. You know, like, <laughs> you got to slide those things in. Um, but yeah, it's... Like you were talking about in the low income, uh, it seems to be that's just been the trend and no one has called it out in Hawaii to be that. Like, hey, you understand that there is an indigenous population, I hate that word indigenous, but a native population, whatever, there's Hawaiians here and you're spraying them and then you're paying them to spray themselves, you know, and uh, it's, <laughs> it's really perplexing. So stay tuned because things are coming your way. We face similar issues in Alaska with meetings being held at times when most people